Hey, and welcome back to the best thing you watched this week. I've got Chris from Movies and Munchies, myself, Ruben from the Ruby Tuesday. If this is your first time joining us, what we do is we do a podcast with audio and video. In the audio version, we do an exclusive review, which we don't do in the video stuff. But don't worry, if you're only watching the video stuff, we do all the best things that we watched uh, for that particular week. And then in the audio bit, we do that review. We talk about the things that we're looking forward to coming on streaming platforms, cinema, whatever that we're looking forward to coming that week. We might talk about it and any entertainment news. So there's some exclusive stuff for you to look forward to on the podcast as well as the video stuff. And you're so welcome if you're the first time here thank you for joining us and for everybody that comes back week on week with the audience that we're growing and the community that we're growing thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate your eyeballs and your ear buds your balls. ear balls ear balls <laughs> Yeah, balls. I don't know. Yeah, sure. I don't know. yeah. Well, why not? <laughs> uh, we also do a Patreon, and this week we're going to be talking about the highest streaming TV series and possibly movies of 2022. I think that'll be an interesting discussion. We have over 45 videos on Patreon there at the moment, ranging from craziness to uh, just you know a little bit in depth more of discussions of TV series, what have you, on various tiers. But the way we start every week is we do a video quiz and a question. And the video quiz is always about reviews. No, the video no. quiz is about movies <laughs> um, normally. And uh, I'm going to let Chris take it on from here. <laughs> I'm going to do a quote from a review and you have to guess which review. It <laughs> right. Is. Yeah, that would be so weird. My brain. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, and also before we begin, um, I think we need to, to draw special attention to our attire. Um, <laughs> somebody had said in the comments, Ruben, you should wear a flannel. Chris, you should wear a t-shirt. There you go. We we swapped. Ruben's got a, just a snazzy. Oh, I use the word snazzy. I sound like my grandfather. An outstanding looking flannel there. So, hmm, good yeah. choice. All right. Well, for our movie quote quiz, last week um, we had a new winner, which was outstanding, Matthew, mm -hmm. who got all three. Um, honorable mention to Nostromo, who got two out of the three with the actual titles, but knew the third movie was a Tom Hanks movie. So close. Very close. Almost. Okay. But you didn't get the title. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No. All right. So the, uh, the answers were The Untouchables, mm. Guardians of the Galaxy, yep. and You've Got Mail. Yeah. I didn't get You Got Mail. No, <laughs> it, it was more of an obscure one. That was mm. that was a harder one, I, I definitely admit. It's, yeah, it might noodle you a little bit, like niggle on your brain. Like, I've heard that, but yeah, placing it. If I heard it, I wouldn't be able to have placed it either. Mm. Okay. Uh, today's, though, I'm going fairly easy, I think. Okay. I think they're easy. Okay. So. <clears throat> Let's do it. Okay. Number one. Dishes are done, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Okay. I, <laughs> I think I know Number who two. it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like there's a part in be before that where I could do a sound effect, but I'm not going to because I think that gives it too much weight. All right. Uh, anyway. Okay. Uh number two. He's not Judge Judy and Executioner. Mm. Yep. I couldn't do the accent and do the thing, so there you go. You get me. Um, okay. And number three. Congratulations. You're stupid in three languages. It's <laughs> a great one. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nice. I love that one. Yeah, it's a really good one. Not, not, not a massive fan of the movie, but <laughs> the quote is outstanding in that scene. It is good. So, yeah. If you have guesses, put your guesses to, of the movie titles down below in the comments. Um, we'll give you a shout out next week. Yeah. So uh, now, Ruben, do you have a question for us? I do. And I think it's a little bit on, on topic with what's happening at the moment in the entertainment world. We've had uh, all of the Oscar nominations go out mm. this week, you know, which is coming off BAFTAs. We, we having uh, the, what are they called? The Zavis? No, the... Oh, Razzies? The Razzies, thank you. Yes. And a little bit of controversy of them having to mm -hmm. retract some mm -hmm. of their, because they, like, nominated a really young girl, and people are like, you can't do that. It's a kid. Stop yeah, it. Yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah. yeah, come on, man. <laughs> um, so my question is, we have a lot of award ceremonies. 
is the Oscars because the Oscars used to be the one that was the thing that everybody aspired to. Are the Oscars relevant? Do we even need them? Or are they just for the actors to celebrate the job that they're doing? Because it used to be a big televised thing where people used to enjoy watching it. And I think there's still some that do, but I think it's mostly those that are in the entertainment industry, those maybe film critics or part of the crew that have been part of the film or a part of entertainment somehow that watch it because it means something to them because it might be somehow related to the job or their life. But I think in the zeitgeist of what people caring about whether the rich people go out into the red carpets and, you know, what they wear, who am I wearing today, Bob? Uh, with <laughs> how pretentious it's been getting over the last few years, you know, and then the silliness of like Will Smith slapping, you know, over a, a stupid joke that shouldn't have been said, but him thinking that it's okay for him to hit another person in front of millions of people. Before that, during the the COVID, we had the most ridiculous televised uh, um, ceremony. That was bonkers. That was a weird ceremony. Mm -hmm. Do we need it? I would argue no, we don't. Um, I think people are going to tune in this year because of the controversy of last year with just the, the zaniness of Will Smith and what antics got up. So I think people are going to be hoping maybe that mm. something else weird like that spectacle happens. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's going to. I think they're going to be much on like on edge and mm. ready for any type of strangeness that could happen, any type of drama like that. Um <clears throat> I mean, you, you nailed it on your head with it's, it's the, the actors giving themselves awards, Yeah, you know, it, it, I think it helps them from a marketable standpoint, maybe within studios. There used to be a time where when you would see Academy Award winner, you know, with, you know, Academy Award nominee, and that meant something. And now I don't, I don't know. I mean, first off, we have so many award shows. Yeah. Right. That it and for as many problems as I think the Golden Globes have, especially with their their hierarchy and their just behind the scenes, their organization itself, um, just from how not current with the times, how not appropriate when it comes to equity versus race and gender and sexuality and all of that. Um, I think, though, they it is a better premise maybe because it's not actors or those in the entertainment industry necessarily nominating it's the foreign press association and so i think something like that maybe we don't necessarily need the golden globes either but something like that mm. that that does um draw attention to the hard work that you know of the of these these people that rises to the top um, to be recognized for, you know, for well done. I mean, some of that you're just paid, you know, we, but in a regular job, a lot of the times you'll have an employee of the month or something like that. And so that's kind of like what this is a little bit, you know, it's a performance review. You did a great job. You get a, you get a raise this year. Okay, cool. Um, as far as relevancy though, I don't know how much, um, like I barely watch anymore. I, I didn't watch the Golden Globes. I just, I looked at the winners. That's yeah. all I cared about. It was just, I just was curious who won, you know, because some of the things where I was just, I was just disappointed that they didn't even get nominated or how, oh, that's weird, you know? And so how about yeah. you though? Yeah. Uh, even, even being part of, you know, because we're in this industry and we have been yeah. for many years in one way or another. <laughs> I used to love, like I used to even sit, you know, sit up, stay awake yeah. till two in the morning watching a four hour, four and a half hour thing that, you know, I'm not getting a water from. I used to love it that the host used to be good. The jokes used to be genuinely funny. The entertainment in between, it was a, it's a big thing. And it's gotten less and less like that. Now they don't even put on the, like the relevant, like last year, they didn't even put the, some of the ones that I wanted to see of the Oscars, the, they just like, oh, in between the ad breaks, this, we announced, I'm saying, are you kidding? Like, why, why did you do that? And it's just become more and more of a look at me. This is who I'm wearing. Uh, this is about like me showcasing this film almost. And then it's become more and more a, of a stepping stone for whatever that actor is 
feeling like they need to share to the world, mm. right? And this is my, it was like, do every, every other day of like your life be talking about that and, you know, go to your places and do that rather than the one time you know, I'm receiving the Oscar. And, and it almost feels like a gimmick for them to, because mm. it used to be, thank you God for, you know, my mom and dad. And that, that's all fine. But now it's like world peace. And it's like, where have you been for the whole year? <laughs> anyway. I don't know that we need them. I think the star power that we used to have in the 90s and 2000s, where the actors were the big thing, like the A-listers, mm. we don't have that so much anymore. Even The Rock can't draw in the money that they used to. If you put a name or a title of a person, it doesn't mean that much anymore. And that's why students try, students, uh, studios try and put on like this title from A24 now to become like production companies. It's getting really ridiculous, you know, out there, Marvel from Marvel, the presenter of Marvel, you know, it used to be from Brad Pitt's studio company or, or it used to be Brad Pitt. And we've really kind of going away from that. So the sort of the star thing that used to be Stallone and, you know, Brad Pitt, all mm -hmm. those guys, it doesn't seem to be that thing anymore. So it feels less and less relevant. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I don't know. You should let us know in the comments what, you, like, would you, if you're in the UK, for one, would you stay up and watch this four hour thing? Or are you not even bothered? Because I doubt many people would be bothered. Uh, or will you even catch it on replay? Because I don't know if any people will in the UK. Yeah, you might watch something on YouTube, maybe. Yeah. Like a like clip of something. Some if there was smart YouTuber that has managed to like get the best clips and just, yeah. And get past all the copyright stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah just put his own order, <laughs> dub it for himself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. oh funny yeah oh, right but uh talking about that chris talking yeah. about the oscars i've decided to include four new oscars and i'm going to award them tonight okay so, uh, okay so for the slowest movie that i've ever seen i'm going to give the oscar to beau travel a French cinema film that was the most painful movie I've ever watched. This is part of the Criterion movie selection that I was sent. Now, I know this is meant to be one of those films that you're meant to watch uh, in your lifetime. And I understand its art. I understand its mise-en-scene. And I understand this flew totally over my head. And some people are going to be shouting at me. But I just want to say congratulations, Boo, Bo, <laughs> Treville. You are the slowest film I've ever ever seen you win the oscar how how long is it uh, i aged it's 93 minutes oh, I aged. <laughs> wow 93 minutes and you felt the time that's yeah. terrible yeah 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 that's i still so, don't know uh, what this movie was about oh see <laughs> i got burned a bunch of times by french movies i've had better experiences as of late but there was there was a period in the early mid 90s there where i was just like what the i don't even <laughs> i i must be missing something huge like it's a cultural thing or something you know and but mm. uh, and for the second okay. oscar uh yes. for the worst pilot for a new tv series that i've Ooh. ever seen Wolfpack, congratulations. You guys outdid yourselves. I've never seen anything quite like this. Going from B-movie horror, where a guy's head is imploded by a deer stamping on it, and me going, wow, you're going there, to the worst dialogue I have ever heard in a pilot. Me going, how did this get greenlit? Take it. So, so Ruben messaged me this week and he told me this. He's like, I've seen the worst pilot ever. And I'm like, ooh, what is it? I'm intrigued. <laughs> so tell us. So so those of us that are unaware of what it is or whatever, where would we see it so that we can avoid it? Or if we're really into some just self-flagellation, we can it's, torture It's in ourselves. Paramount Plus. Okay. Uh, it's a new... It, the only reason that I started watching is because it's called Wolfpack. I love uh -huh. me some um, like werewolf series or movies I'm, I'm always into the fantasy stuff and wolfpack i was like okay i know what this is about it's got sarah michelle geller and i knew they were going to go teeny with it sure but they just they uh, are you dumber for having watched it 
I'm, I'm complex because they threw <laughs> all new law. I was like, okay, you're doing something different with the, you oh. just, they can do this. <laughs> but then when I was seeing some of the CG, when I was seeing what they were doing, uh, this, mm-hmm. okay. So when you get bitten, the one girl that gets bitten, she had really bad acne and uh, the, the, the wolf powers healed her acne. Oh, she, she becomes, well, cool. but when she's looking in the mirror, it's so airbrushed. Like it's like smooth airbrushed. And then from oh, then wow. on, they're not really focusing on her face, I guess, because maybe she does have acne. I don't know. But it, it was a really weird thing to do and, and establish that way. There are just so many choices in this that I just, I, no idea I why. couldn't get past. I was just like, <laughs> what is happening in this show? <laughs> Uh, okay. okay. Um, for the for the third Oscar, the award yes. goes to the series, a fantasy series, Willow. And the new Oscar is for the darkest episode of TV I've ever seen. Now, I'm not saying darkest as in genre. I mean physical color of black that you couldn't see anything in. The fourth episode of Willow, we switched off our bedroom light. We closed the curtains. We closed the door. I still couldn't see what was going on. So we tried a normal, it's just normal switching the light, watching an episode of TV, switch it back on, see nothing. But what's going on the screen is obviously big budget, lots of fighting. If you've seen the episode that everybody talks about of Game of Thrones, so you know that dark episode, that's great, you can't see. This is way worse. (laughs) (laughs) And your TV wasn't broken? I mean, it it didn't... because... (laughs) I'm going to talk about a black and white film and the best thing I watched. And okay. that's very dark, but I could see everything going on in it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> okay. The last award for the new Oscars yes. that I think they should do <laughs> goes to the cringiest movie I've ever seen Ooh. called You People. Congratulations. You made me do this for most of the film. Just not having it, huh? It's got an incredible cast, an amazing oh. array of actors. I don't know what happened to it. And also, the people that liked it are very, very angry that I don't like it. <laughs> um, oh, sure. But thankfully, that seems to be outweighed by the number of people that were commenting in my review, review going, this is garbage. This is mm. nonsense. What happened? Why is Eddie Murphy like this? Why haven't they allowed him to be funny? He's just dry oh. and humorless. Why are some of these jokes actually racist when this was the thing that you were trying to point out between Jews and African-American? What has happened to the script? <laughs> mm, that's a bummer. Yeah. It's, you know, so um, uh, they love me. They really love me. Anyway, that's, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you wanted to be included in those new categories for Ruben's Oscars, but hey. <laughs> Congratulations. Look, maybe one biggest nonsense of the week is fine, but four, and mm. they're all different for different reasons, just terrible. I'm just, no. Nah. Yeah, you just, you had to. I had yeah. to have a, a, a new segment for us. <laughs> Oscar award goes to. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to change the trajectory? Would you like to talk about perhaps the best thing you watched? Yes, let's do okay. it. Let's talk about right. good stuff. Cool. Tell me what was it? What was because you've t- you've told me four things that were horrible. So, <laughs> all right. So to redeem Criterion, there's a film yes. that I didn't know that I needed to see. It's a black oh. and white film. When it, when it, when they made it, uh, they made it with a really incredible cast. They made it. A, it's 1955, so it's quite old. Uh, th- they decided to, the director decided to do it uh, in black and white. He could have done it mm. in color, but it was, is based on a book. And when it came out, critics didn't know what to do with it. Um, when, no, when they eventually watched it, because the studio didn't know what to do with it. I don't even think it got to cinemas, but only later in 1970s, did it become a cult classic? And then later, I think 1977, did it get written into one of those segments where we keep it? You know, there's uh-huh. a there's a vault of films that we that are now cult classics of films that we regard highly. It's called The Night of the Hunter, and it's one of the scariest films children will ever watch. And the reason I say children because it's it's about children. Okay, so the synopsis: The Night right. of the Hunter. Incredibly, the only film the great 
uh, actor Charles Lawton ever directed. It's truly a standalone masterwork, a horror movie with qualities of the gr- of a grim fairy tale. It starts in a sublimely sinister Robert Mitchum as a traveling preacher named Harry Powell, whose nefarious motives for marrying a fragile widow played by Shelley Winters are uncovered by her terrified young children. So basically you have a dad he comes running to his son gives his son ten thousand dollars say hide this never tell anybody about it the dad has stolen this money he no longer wanted his kids to live in the world of poverty he saw that, that mm. that's that's what was coming something nasty happens to the dad so the mother is now got these two children to look after but the, the dad said don't tell your mother even because she won't look after the money so it's only the daughter and the son that know where the money is the preacher that is the big bad is the guy that's in the jail cell with the dad uh, that something happens. So he hears about the money. So he comes pretending to be this great man. And basically it's, it's, it's this guy relentlessly hunting these kids, uh, trying to find out where the money... And for the majority of the film, it's just these two kids on their own trying to survive this preacher who has such a menacing aura about him. But the way it's filmed is Hitchcockian. It's mm. it has it's not German expresses expressionism, but it has nods towards German expressionism. So some of the sets you'll see like representing uh, just in the bedroom. There's like shadows that that are like steeples mm. that represent mm-hmm. a church. There's all very sharp uh, lines. Um, black and whites they specifically use the type of film a new type of film that really darkens the blacks but it it makes the rest then stand out Uh, and this whole crew that filmed this this film was on board the previous film together so they came they practiced using this new this new film Mm. that had just come out and then they came on to this set and so they knew exactly what to do so yeah you get a gothic noir investigation family uh story that is only a 12 but there are parts of it you're like well that's horrific even to some of the <laughs> songs that the children sing you're like they're singing about a hanging and then you re- you recognize the references to the other kids who've experienced a hanging it's just mm. so airy and it's so in contrast with each other all the time seriously a masterwork you don't know that you're engrossed until you're like oh i'm sitting for it okay it's fine i'm fine I'm, i'll sit back again but it's one of those that just kind of grips you. And then when it ends, you're like, wow, that was weird. How have I never seen this movie? Incredible, incredible film. I have never seen this movie, but it's going on my list. So this sounds like, because this is one of the, the Criterion ones that they sent you, right? The 1001 movies yeah. that you should see. And Okay. Yeah. So this sounds like it's a good one. <laughs> one to actually, <laughs> that you should see. I should nice. put it in context. I did watch the Bo Travel beforehand. And, uh, you know, so so maybe anything afterwards is just genius (laughs) and gold. (laughs) But honestly, you should have watched you people after Bo. (laughs) Yeah, you should have. have. (laughs) But this was this was phenomenally good. Yeah. Nice. Okay, And you said it was uh, Robert Mitchum and um, Shelley Winters. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. I'll show show the cover again. Yeah. It's seriously, seriously good. Okay. cool. Yeah. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. That sounds Mm. dark and disturbing. And I like that. So, Chris, you've had an interesting week where it's been Sundance. So I I didn't know what you were going to bring to us. I don't even know how much normal stuff you've been watching because you've had and you've been on a business trip. So what's on your first list? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's it's. um, Yeah, I have. As of this recording, I have watched eight of my 22 Sundance movies that I bought tickets for. Jeez. Um, I have 14 left. And for context, my my movies expire. My access expires on Sunday night. It is Saturday um, oh, so late afternoon for hours. me. Um, yeah, I have, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so Chris is not going to sleep. Um, right. Yeah, no, but I did. Yeah, I've been on a business trip also, which um prevented watching a lot Mm. um so yeah anyway um actually though the first thing i want to talk about was one that i actually got to see in the theater at the beginning of the week because you my friend had told me it was coming out i did not (laughs) know about it and it's funny too because the first movie this is a sequel but it's actually a prequel 
Um, I didn't know that one was coming out until a friend had told me about it. And <laughs> and so we went and saw it and was like, whoa, that was outstanding. And so when you told me this, it's The Wandering Earth 2. And it is this Chinese sci-fi epic that is just, um, I didn't realize it was a prequel going in. No, it um, didn't. I, I, yeah, I didn't see anybody say it was, so yeah. Yeah, and I didn't watch a trailer. Maybe mm. I should have. It doesn't mm. really matter because I was excited to see it because I enjoyed the first one. Um the first movie is all about uh, we have destroyed. It's in the future. We have destroyed the atmosphere. Um, actually, no, that's not what it is. It is in the future. The sun is expanding. And what it's going to do is it's going to envelop the earth and then explode. So they need to um, get the earth away. So they come up with this plan to build rockets all around the earth and then yeah. create make earth a spaceship. <clears throat> cool. So this is all about everything leading up to that. First movie was really exciting. This one gives us a lot of backstory. The The beginning of the movie is chaotic um, because it's just, it's a lot of information all at once and mm. we're bouncing back and forth and hard to focus kind of on characters, who they yeah. are and why they might be important. Um, it, but it does click and then it becomes, I mean, incredibly just tense and uh very there's a lot of excitement that is built and you know because this is a prequel some of it you already know where it's going to lead to right we know that the earth has all these engines on it already so as they're leading up to oh my gosh we have to do this test and what if it fails or anything else well i kind of know that the engines at some point work mm. so you yeah, know and true. i was worried yeah. is this going to be Am I going to want to sit through it? Because it's almost three hours long, too. And so if you know long the movie. end game already, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I was riveted. I mean, there are big action sequences that you, I mean, it's a ride. Like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on. Um, there's these all of these drones and all of these airplanes at some point. Mm. And, then, and then amidst that, there's other craziness going on. And so this action sequence is just, I mean, it, you can focus on it. So it's not so crazy that it's just becomes a big blur of anything. Mm, that's good. Um, you know, and you're bouncing between characters and you're like, whoa, oh my gosh. So anyway, it's, it, the movie itself from an action standpoint, very exciting. From a story standpoint, it becomes enveloping because you watch these, um, these groups of people who are learning to work together. Mm. You know, the um, I've gotten so many comments from, I, I I guess they're white racists. That's the only thing I can think oh, of. Oh, seriously? They're, yeah, they're, they're like, this is just importing communism and Chinese propaganda. And I'm like, Ugh. I didn't see any Chinese propaganda. There was no, <clears throat> there was nothing in this movie that was like, Ch yeah, exactly. Mm. There was nothing though that was like China good, everybody else bad. Mm. It was, oh my gosh, we need to work together because bad things are about to happen to everybody. So let's all get on board and work together. Mm. So whatever. But um, the the acting is really good. There's, um, there is some wonky uh, dubbing that goes on. Whatever. Um, there's this British dude or he's an English or an American dude. Ugh. I don't really know. He has this big tantrum yeah. at the end and it's over the top and it's childish and it's, it's funny, but it's not meant to be funny. I think I, for me watching <laughs> it, I was just like, oh gosh, I need to slap you. You know, it's the um, issue I had in RRR with the British guy with the weird with the Brit yeah, accent. That's exactly who I thought of in this, mm. you know, that he's so over the top and so demon demonstrative yeah. that you're like, you've actually become comedic. Yeah, exactly. And, that. and, yeah. and that's not what the it. scene is actually calling for, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, this this pulls in a lot of different ideas too because it, it has uh, some ideas of like a second life type of thing where hmm. like AI or, you know, um, augmented reality or a, um, okay. you know, what do we do with, like our consciousness, right. you know? And so there's these questions that are brought up there and it, it plays in deeper. And I love at the end of the movie, it brings us up to current times. Mm. And then 
it makes you wonder, are they going to do a third one? Because mm. there is a mid credit scene that introduces some stuff that could point to a third movie. I don't know if it actually is going to or not. Um, and a lot of people in the comments said that there was like 80 minutes that was cut from the movie. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder if we could so get I like would, a Blu-ray release, like a extended edition. The, yeah, the full director's cut or whatever. Oh my gosh, that would be outstanding. So this was, I mean, this is definitely, it, it was hard to find it in my area. There were not a lot of theaters that were playing it. Um, it was packed though when I went, which was outstanding. Um, so yeah, I think if you, if you enjoy just sci-fi, mm. you know, um, some of it plausible, some of it not. Um, but it doesn't matter because it's also action and it's drama. There's some good emotional beats to it as well. Like I, I wasn't sure I was actually going to connect as much with a couple of the characters because at that beginning it is so chaotic and you're just kind of, you know, you see this relationship begin, but it's very quick. And yet in that quickness, they have these beats that, at least for me, I connected with because they were emotional in the right amount of, like in the right setting. Hmm. So yeah, okay. definitely worth uh, worth checking out if- um, I really want you know, to see the first it, one, but it's, it's not showing locally like you were saying. It's really hard to find. Mm. Well, the first one came to Netflix within, I want to say like a year. Yeah, that's where so, I saw it. Yeah. So maybe a streaming platform, I mean, maybe even Netflix, I don't know, but maybe maybe they will pick up this mm. also and uh fingers crossed you know yeah. which yeah exactly which i mean that's how you know that's how we experienced rrr mm. it had been in a very limited access in theaters but then the streaming so yeah um so yeah because it wandering earth wasn't playing locally there was an indian movie that's playing locally and that's called Pathan. and the more I think about it, the more I think maybe it shouldn't be on the best thing I watched because, and I know everybody's going to hate me, like, how, ah, what could you say? Because it is really just, it's, the story is what you'd expect it. You see the, the, um, I guess you see everything coming. However, I had so sure. much fun with the ridiculousness of Pathan that um, <clears throat> that's why it's on here, just because I enjoyed it so much. The action is over the top. It belongs in the 90s with MTV music style, Bollywood for, uh, like music video style bits. There's only two music videos, one in the middle, one at the end that kind of wraps mm. up the film. It's also part of the spy verse, which I didn't know. I've actually seen one of them, War. I didn't know that was part of the, the spy verse film that's on there. Oh, really? It's on Netflix, okay. yeah. Uh, and apparently there's a couple of other films that we need to go find out with the character that's mentioned in this film uh, that mm. he's done two films already. And as far as I can tell, there might be like an Avengers type of movie coming with the Spyverse with all those characters, oh. uh, which would be awesome. But this film, <laughs> it's, it firstly, culture shock for me in the cinema. Uh, I was the only white guy in the cinema. I was fully <laughs> packed. Nice. And the way people enjoyed it, I think that helps the experience being really mm -hmm. enjoyable. A lot of people recording, which I didn't mind at the time because it was like for moments of a particular actor that came on board. They were like, oh. ching, ching, just recording clips everywhere. <laughs> and then like when the title come up, the people like recording. And then <laughs> the woman that were uh, <laughs> seeing a certain guy shirtless, which happened a number of times. Some, I swear, were orgasming in like, they were, they were like <laughs> slapping the arm uh, of the and they're like oh, oh, literally that Whoa. type of noise and i was just like oh cool like if i did that <laughs> to a woman i get chucked out and stoned probably but you do you <laughs> um, and uh, then there were other guys checking the emails so you know <laughs> they, you, have, you have a bit of everything uh but yeah for the most part really really enjoyable over the top action i think i mentioned to you there's one action sequence to give you an example a guy smashes through the window using the someone else as a shield because a grenade is blowing up and he lands on the helicopter blade slides off and then takes on another guy with a roundhouse kick at the bottom it's that's the sort of movie that you're going to get it's definitely james bond pierce brosnan era mm, that's that's okay. the, the type of thing you're getting and then more over the top than that. 
I got to tell you. So Ruben messaged me um, this week and he told me about it. He's like, yeah, I'm in a, there's an intermission. I've seen I'm actually in a movie that has a proper intermission. I'm like, oh, what do you see? And he tells me, I'm like, I have no idea what this is. Never heard of it. So I, I watched the trailer and I immediately, no joke, immediately text my family. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to see this on Monday night because I knew I couldn't see it this weekend because I had all these Sundance movies. It's like, I'm going to see this on Monday night. Who wants to come with me? And I, you know, I gave a brief little, it looks like a crazy over the top action movie that is absolutely ridiculous. And yet it looks like so much fun. Here's the link to the trailer, you know, and my oldest son was like, I'm in. And then <laughs> my youngest. So we ended up, my wife and uh, my daughter-in-law were both kind of like, mm, no, <laughs> you guys go have fun. Um, so I, we, we have in the U S at least at, um, at the Cinemark theaters, we have what are called D box. They move. Mm. So yes. they, they vibrate. Yeah, we have a similar one. thing. Yeah. Do you have it? Okay. Mm. Well, I saw one movie recently with that, and I really wish I would have seen both Top Gun and oh, um, yes. yeah. a Bullet Train yeah, in D-Box. Yeah, that would have been Because amazing. I think those movies... <clears throat> yeah. So I paid the extra money. Oh my gosh, it was $60 for three of us to go to the movies <laughs> on Monday night, this coming Monday night. But we got the D-Box, and... I don't know. Maybe I'm going to throw up. Maybe I'll be thrown <laughs> out of the seat. I don't know. But the the movement combined with what was going on, I mean, oh. it just looks it looks bright and flashy. Like I the s- like the trailer looks just it's like oversaturated almost with color and the, the action it, sequences alone on the D box. Like you're just going to have so much fun. It's, it's ridiculous. So excited. Yeah. I, I don't even care if the move like you said it's uh, predictable. Whatever. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I'm going because I want to see the action like I saw in the trailer. Mm. I mean, it's kind of like uh, Expendables, right? Yes. Expendables is a stupid movie if you think about it. Oh, yeah. But the action and all of the nostalgia that's packed in there because of the actors. Mm. I don't know how loud they'll have it in yours, but our speakers, like in our summer, was barely handling the reverberation. Like it was distorting. Oh. So, oh, wow. yeah, it was like <laughs> that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> like, like pushing and, that limit like this like and that's almost it. just in the the punching because it's just like <laughs> like when the, it's just so <laughs> over the top in the kicking and the punching like i don't even need to give you a synopsis there's just bad guys trying to destroy the world is super duper spy dude trying to save it like like that's it that that's the premise that's all i want that's all i want and then, <laughs> it's no joke just oh, enjoyable yeah oh my gosh so two weeks in a row ruben has told me about a movie that i didn't know about <laughs> and i have bought tickets so i am <laughs> here we go i shall be telling you more about it later yes so, all right uh, so what's next on your list uh, this was a uh, the only other thing that that actually came out this week. Um, it was on Netflix, and it's called The Snow Girl, mm. and it is a Spanish um, mystery. Yeah, sort of. Did you did you get a chance to see this? I didn't get screeners, so I didn't have time. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. how that goes. Yeah, fair now. enough. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. No, I totally get that. Um, so it it's based off a novel, and I haven't read the novel, but I am intrigued now by the writer. Okay. Uh, because the the content of this is pretty dark. It's a um, a young girl is kidnapped um, during a parade, and this is her family now uh, trying to find her. You know, the search mm. for her. And then there's also this investigative journalist who has her own baggage and her own trauma from her life that we see a little bit here and there in flashbacks. But she is obsessed with the case, right. and she is then. She's actually doing more to investigate than the police are. And um, we see this this spans like a bunch of years. Mm. And as it goes along, we just see the the toll that it takes on the family in little bits and pieces. They're actually not in this very much. The story becomes more so about the reporter okay. and um, interspersed with her own trauma, which is we understand what it is. Mm. We see what it is, which is horrifying. But the mystery of that part of it, because it's still unknown to her, is unknown mm. to us. And they don't they don't conclude that part. So that could be an annoyance. Fair enough. Um, the 
the story of the little girl, I mean, it's always interwoven in there, but it's just this search. Um, I think the series is a little too long uh, just because it's six episodes, six episodes. Yeah, I think it's six episodes, um, 45 ish minutes. So it's not that bad, you know, uh, but because we see re repetition, especially within the reporter's backstory um, or her trauma, that gets to be a little bit much, you know, mm. so but so at the end of it, let me <clears throat> the end of the series, there is a conclusion to the mystery and to the story. Okay. So this is not a limited series though. So, um, because at the end it leaves it to follow now the reporter. Oh, okay. And Clever. Like, like she becomes like, it becomes a detective story, but mm. she's our detective that we would follow. So right. if Netflix doesn't renew this, you can be satisfied that the story that it starts with gets a conclusion. You know, you can be a little annoyed that the reporter story doesn't really have a conclusion because she she still hasn't solved that for herself yet, and so it's unsolved for us. Yeah. Um, but um, so I had said like in my review, you know, I like I enjoyed the mystery of this, but I'm really now intrigued. By the end of it, I was like, oh my gosh, I really want to follow the. The reporter. That's mm. the story that I'm most interested in now. And I want to see her solve another case. You know, it, it becomes less about the case, I guess, and more about the character. Yeah. And even though the case itself is is interesting or dark or at least engaging. And so it's um yeah. If you haven't seen it, I mean if you like if you like those foreign dark kind of drama thriller types of things, mm. I mean it, it it's worth checking out. Um yeah, it was but not bad by any means. Um, okay. So just, and I get what you, I get for you. I mean, you know, if we don't get it early with everything mm. else that we have to watch. It just, yeah, it's hard to catch up, but it, it was on yeah. my radar. It was something that looked interesting, looked like it could yeah. be like you had decent thriller sort of vibes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And though, you know, the one other thing really quick, there's a, um, there, at least it was for me there. It's not misdirection, but it, there's mystery that's thrown in from character actions where it instills doubt in you mm. of th with the character and which is fun because then it's, you know, while a lot of it might be predictable in certain spots, there were shocking moments that I didn't see coming or that I was like, Oh wow. I didn't, it, you, Whoa, you did something there. <laughs> or like I look at a character and I go, I don't know about you. Nice. And, well, that's good when they do that. Cause yeah. you know, that's unusual for us when, cause normally we see everything we've seen so much. So if it can sort yeah. of subvert your expectations is, it's yeah. a really good thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had a season two of anime on Netflix this week called Record of Ragnarok. Mm. Uh, it's basically about the gods uh, are fed up with humans and uh, they're going to wipe us out. They're going to take us to extinction. But in order for us to not do that, there's a Valkyrie that's willing to help us. Uh, mm. in a competition where the greatest warriors fight against the gods and obviously uh, this is throughout time so you can choose any warriors and who the valkyrie chooses is she's got a, a really interesting mind for basically like she's a master strategist piecing things oh. together ahead of time of who would best be so in season two because like each season contains like about three matches uh, in this one we actually only have two because each m each fight takes a number of episodes and then we get a bit of story oh, wow. in between and we're starting to catch up with the actual manga so i think there'll probably be three or four seasons when it finishes mm. um but in what anime or story can you ever have saying where you've got hercules fighting jack the ripper oh really and that was enough to me for me to go okay i'm in um, the thing is, what I wasn't expecting by the end of the season is I, will, I didn't want any of the characters to lose because they oh. give so much backstory to each of the characters. So we have a fight and they start the fight and then there'll be a line of uh, the character will say something that will trigger memory. And then we get like a whole episode of just backstory of what happened to that character to get there. And so we get that on Hercules. We've had law on Hercules before, but there's so much stuff that like they incorporated to make Hercules character more likable. I mean, we like mm -hmm. him anyway, but and then somehow they made me brute for Jack the Ripper, like because and, and he's like still he's totally evil. 
but you understand like him fighting the how he got to where he did like mm-hmm. the, this backstory of ah oh, yeah i see how you got there i don't like anything you did but i understand why you are fighting on the humanity side uh, and why you were the best fighter for that job and so the second one it was equally interesting um i'm trying to remember their names anyway it's it's just one of those weird animes that doesn't seem to know quite what it is are you a fighting anime or are you a story and it tries to toe the line between both now the fans of the actual manga weren't impressed with season one and i understand that i didn't mind it but this season feels like it's took taken a step in the right direction it's there's still some story that i would have liked another couple of episodes that uh, give us more story in the background of what other characters are doing because they they look so interesting there's so many different gods it's not just um like so you've got odin and zeus like a mixture of gods there but you've also got all the indian gods you've got you know um uh shiva is one of the fighters that we see uh which was a fantastic fight and yeah, so just 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 numerous really weird guys that you're itching to see more of and their character designs. But it's so much fun. Like I flew by the the ten episodes, uh, very very quick to watch. Yeah, nice. Uh, what uh, what streaming platform is it on? That's did you Netflix. Say? Yeah, Netflix. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So is the first season like ten episodes also? Yeah, both uh, both ten, both very yeah. easy to binge. Nice. Uh, Okay, so uh, next on my list, this is actually one that I saw at Sundance, and I have zero clue as to when this is actually going to come out. Um, What's it called? It's called Cat Person, and it stars Amelia Jones um, from CODA, and Mm. who is also in um, the Key, House of Keys, Key, what what was that show? Lock and Key, that's what it is. Uh, but, But the other character in this it's the actor Nicholas Braun. Now, the actor is also in Succession. I have not seen that series yet. But as I'm watching, I'm like, dude, you look so familiar. So I mm-hmm. looked him up on IMDb. And do you remember Sky High? I can mm. not remember Sky High, right? Of course. That's so, a great, so you great know the, the really tall, blonde-haired kid who just glows in the dark? That was his sidekick. <laughs> you know, he is the other star in this movie. Hmm. So, so yeah, which is which is funny because he's really really tall, and Amelia <laughs> Jones is really not tall. Yeah. So she's, the, she's, the, the, <laughs> anyway, this is an uncomfortable and haunting movie. Um, right. My wife and I were talking about it the other day because it has stuck with us after watching it. Um, it's about this couple, well, these two people, and the movie examines what is said and unsaid and how that that poor communication uh whether through self-censoring or through uh body language or feeling what the other person you know like you take on what the other person you assume they're feeling or thinking and so you don't say something or you interpret what they say it's all about i mean all of the bad communication that happens within individuals and then couples and you then take that and make it as a romance into a thriller and it is different it it is and i'm sure i'm sure when people see it they're going to be mixed on how they feel about it because there's there's a gut reaction that you have to it but then Mm. i think as you as you step back from it and then you start having conversations about how each of the characters contribute to the the poor actions mm. and and how it messes each other up and stuff i think um like it's not easy you you could just blanket and be like oh well it's him because he does this or it's her because she does this but i don't think it's that cut and dry and i don't think it's that simple i think there are so many layers to this where you can look at her and go, well, duh, she would totally react this way because he's acting like this. But then you could also look at him and go, well, he's acting like this because he's picking up on this. You know, um, there's some fantastical elements within this. So we get to see inside the characters' heads of how they imagine a scenario going. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's yeah, which, yeah. W- well, it also though sets up for a couple of times where you're like, is this really happening? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> or is yeah, it, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, it's, 
overall, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and more so because of the discussion that it creates surrounding um, the story and the com the the content and the actual the execution of what these actors do. You know what mm. the characters are going undergoing. Um, it was funny too because uh, before the movie starts. Um, at least in the streaming ones, I don't know if it happens in person or not, but, uh, there's a brief little discussion with the director. And so you get to hear sometimes some of their insight or why they made this or why this was special to them or whatever. And the director of this one, she did not, um, she didn't give too much away. She was like, "Eh, I'm not really going to talk about this. And I actually don't want to sway how you feel one way or the other. I just hope that it causes a conversation. And it, it did. Susanna oh. Fogel. Yes. Who incidentally wrote Booksmart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which I, I'm eh, mm-hmm. half and half on that movie, you mm-hmm. know? Um, this one, though, it's, I mean, take, take like so many examples of bad relationships or bad things to do in relationships and then insert them, but under innocence, kind of. Hmm. You know, like it's not necessarily like, like these characters aren't out to sabotage the relationship. Sometimes their actions just do that because of, you know, and then you can also go back to, oh, well, we see part of a family here and then this influences why a character might act this way, whatever. So, so the performances and the story must have been riveting enough to keep you engaged and watching if it's on the best thing you watch. Because I find with these particular stories, it's normally hit or miss. There's no in between. Like they're either good or they're not. Yeah. And it was, it, it is a little slow. I think there's a point where, and I, and that could be because I misread the time. I thought it was going to be like 90 minutes and mm. it's really two hours. Okay. And so that could have been my own mental thing of like, you know, oh, I, I thought this was going to be shorter. Um, it, it, there is a discomfort in it, mm. you know, that you have through it. But yeah, it was riveting. I mean, I was I was very engaged in the conversations because we're able to, as sitting outside of it, to look in to both characters and be like, dude, don't be like that. Dude, yeah. don't be like that, you know? Um, remember that, okay, so the series that you told me about, um, Eternally Confused and Eager for Love, Yes. Remember that? The, the Indian, yeah. Okay. Wonderful series. Yes. The There's a point in there where the guy, the main character, is talking to his dad, and he, it's all about, and he had been having this conversation where he he passes a woman. Like, he doesn't know what to do. You know, when following a woman, it makes them uncomfortable. Mm. You know, he gets that insight of, um, well, if I'm walking too close behind a woman who's walking by herself, that makes <laughs> yeah. her uncomfortable, you know? And so he's like, oh so I gosh. overtook her. I sped up to go around. And the dad's like, you overtook. you just chasing the, the girl exactly, at night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing. It's just bad. You, but, but when you hear it from his perspective, he wasn't trying to be creepy mm. or, you know, or, or anything like that or threatening or anything, but that's exactly how it came across. And so you have some of those elements within this story. That's where it, it not they're they're kind of comedic here and there, but more so it is, I mean, it, it like, it bugs you a little bit in your soul. Mm. And so it's, yeah, it's, I, I can't wait to see who picks this up. Um, I could see it as a, well, I could see it going to, to like a streaming platform really easily. Mm. Um, but I do hope that it gets a distribution within theaters and then it, yeah. So good stuff. Nice. Okay. So next on my list yes. is something that I'm a little bit disappointed that people don't seem to be gravitating towards because it deserves to be watched by everybody and everybody should be watching this. But I could... I could say the same about Ted Lasso. A lot of people were late to the game with Ted Lasso. Mm. And once people started getting into it, they were like, this is genius. And then, I mean, I was late to the game. I didn't, I think I watched the first episode and I just didn't buy it. And then you were like, Ted Lasso is amazing. What are you talking about? And then I watched a few more and then I'd watched all of them. And I was like, when is the next season out? Give it to me now. So from the creators of Ted Lasso, um and Brett Goldstein is one of the creators in this oh. series. Uh shrinking. Mm. 
stars Jason Segel and Harrison Ford. Uh, as a grieving therapist starts to tell his clients exactly what he thinks, ignoring his training and ethics, he finds himself making huge changes to people's lives. So there are 10 episodes, they're half an hour long, uh, very easy to binge. And what surprised me is, sorry, my camera's doing a weird thing. What surprised me is, and uh, no shame, I found myself crying in one episode in, in, in like, I think it was halfway through one episode. And then literally the next line, I was bursting out laughing. Wow. And it got me a number of times like that. I what I don't know what it was. I it maybe just emotionally connected with me. It was something in the characters. But my word, was it a harrowing, funny journey? This guy, after a year of uh, having lost his wife, has gone on a a drug-induced bender with girls he shouldn't be parting with with drugs. And he's just kind of forgotten his 16-year-old daughter that also is now grieving, and she's had to grieve by herself. So she's oh. she's latched on to the neighbor who is, I think, the actress from one of the wives from Scrubs. I think it's also from the creators of Scrubs. Um, she's phenomenal. Is it Krista Miller? Yes. Yeah. My God. Okay my gosh when you get <laughs> these guys together on screen and they're just bantering with each other it feels like they've known each other and they've been doing this series for 10 years it feels like you're on the 10th season of friends and that's how close and quick it, it, the tight knitted the group is so when they rip they like rip each other's hearts out and kind of call each other on their shit and it was like you know it feels right because actually best friends can do that mm. the thing is that it gives time to the side characters you feel like you know them but mm. also it's just the journey of the dad starting to come into a place where he's starting to realize that he needs to sort himself out trying to get his daughter's forgiveness for leaving her alone for the most intense part of our life and then we see it from the daughter's perspective. We see it from the neighbors who are actually really good friends with the wife. The wife who's left a massive gap, not just in the father's life, but in the daughters, in the neighbors, in her best friends who happen to be close in the community and how this death can affected everyone, not just the dad. Once the dad starts realizing that, he's got a lot of things to fix. Then we get the side of the psychiatry where he's with his patients. He's decided to try a new tactic. And that is where it's gold, because we have those two worlds colliding in the best way. And I love it. I mean, I just by the time I hit end the next, not the next day, the day after that, I made my wife start watching it with me again. And I started watching it again through the second time. That's oh, how wow. good the series is. Nice. So are you saying uh, so Harrison Ford is the shrink, right? He's the, the psychiatrist. Harrison Ford is the boss of the shrink. Um, oh, yeah, it's a it's a business, but he's also kind okay. of surrogate dad to the character Jimmy, who's Jason Siegel. And we have a third psychiatrist who's also a sort of best friend, who was best friend to Jimmy's wife. Um, okay. And she, I'm trying to, f oh, what the hell is her name? She, fantastic actress. Oh. Jessica Williams, who plays Gabby. Uh, she's incredible. And so that you have three psychiatrists, they, they we see them go to work, they they banter with each other. Harrison Ford's like big daddy, and he's in charge of the practice as well. But he also knows like what's been going on with Jason Siegel. There are okay. moments where Harrison Ford is so dry, like with his humor, that I just you know immediately cracked up. And then there are other moments when you get to see what's going on in his life, that he has an emotional range where he's shouting at someone on screen in a, like an emotional way. And I was like, I was not expecting that from Harrison Ford. I haven't mm. seen Harrison Ford being allowed to act this way in years. And he's been doing Star Wars and uh, flipping indie for so long that we don't get the fugitive movies anymore from him. But mm -hmm. if you, you remember back in the day, he was phenomenal. Like, yeah. So it was so great. And I was worried because I think I remem mem remember mentioning to you that Harrison Ford's getting on now. He's 75. Yeah. You know, it, can he still, does he still have that presence? Well, for one, he's got the suaveness, like dude oozes just coolness, mm. but then he's still got the acting chops and giving the, the right script, the, the right dialogue can bring it out. Him so. and Jason Siegel, their relationship is fantastic. And then Jason Siegel and the daughter is fantastic. Then Jason Siegel and the partner, 
I think this is Jason Siegel's best work because it it brings out his perfect slackstick comedy that he has done so many times, like a Seth Rogen type of movie that mm-hmm. we've seen in Done to Death. But he takes that bit and then puts it in reality with drama and it just works. It's so good. Nice. Okay, so let me ask you, because oh. Apple does these uh, weekly. Oh right? my gosh, no. No, it's too painful. Okay, so... Like, one, once I started... I was like, yeah, I'm just going to watch the first two because they're just dropping the first two on Friday and then it's Uh weekly. And then I watched the all, all nine. (laughs) Oh, it's not 10. Yeah, it's all nine episodes. Okay. Uh, Yeah, maybe wait. (laughs) Okay, so so it's better. It's one of these that like you watch like in chunks? Yeah, chunks would be good. Yeah, three episodes at once. That could be good. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, because I... It kills me with the with the weekly yeah, release man. of a short episode, you know. Yeah, hmm. yeah, uh, and and okay. some some of them are doozies the way they leave them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I, it looks great. I mean, that's the thing. You know, I I like a lot of the actors in there, so that's that's outstanding. And to, I mean, I'm intrigued also by Jason Siegel's character just deciding to abandon maybe the the what the therapist is supposed just, to say he's just reached his wits end and his clients like he's had a year the worst year of his life and his clients the sum that he's been treating for over two years not making a single bit of difference so he's at that point there's a moment like okay no i'm just gonna we're gonna do this <laughs> <laughs> oh funny cool I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna, yeah, it's been on my list to see it now that it's out. But because I don't have the screeners, I think I will wait a little bit yeah. and get a get a decent it's bench going for that. that. Yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else on your list? Are uh, you done? I'm done. Yeah. Um, Lockwood and Co. came out. Yes. I know you haven't had time because you've been so busy, but yeah. Chris I wanted to see this though. Watch it. <laughs> It's such a weird series, and it could easily have been another one of those teenaged angst with magic mm. series that are so much on Netflix and often yeah. often will get cancelled because I don't know. There's not enough not enough people watching. But what works is that the mix. Well, firstly, it's based on books again. That apparently, quite mm. loved books I've never heard of. But it's the mixture, I think, of the the, the dry Brit humor. And the mm-hmm. fact that you're having fantasy ghosts are, are 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 alive have been for 15 years. There's this law that we don't really know about, but the people that can help us are youngsters because they have an ability to see ghosts, and there's various different types of ghosts, and and that's why kids from the age of 13 are trained by different specialist groups of like security groups that are sent out to stop them and deal with ghosts that are, are pestering people. Adults can't see them. They might be able to sense it, but that's it. And you also lose your ability as you reach like age 18, you start basically losing your power. So you have a short amount of time. So there's a always a limited amount of time to the storylines as well. But it's mm-hmm. also so British, sometimes Cockney suave, sometimes just in your face is like, yeah, that's so quintessential British. It's also cleverly and annoyingly sometimes pitched at our three main protagonists age which is uh, 15 16 17 and so they do things that are stupid they act their age they make the wrong decisions they go into a fight with ghosts unprepared really even though they should know better they they're like I'm 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 flying on hormones and I'm flying on stupidity. I gotta prove myself to this girl next to me who's pretty hot and I I wanna show her that I'm actually I'm a I'm a man, although I'm sixteen, I'm a man. And so they do <laughs> they find themselves in, in situations that are ridiculous. Now it's Lockwood and Co. and Lockwood is this young kid who's inherited the house and he's trying to keep it and pay for it himself. Mm-hmm. There's no adult in charge of Lockwood and Co's. All the other ones have big adults that are basically like parenting the the, the young yeah. group and training them. Uh, you all have to have a certain amount of training to be able to go into it. So you have like different licenses. And our Lockwood and Co inherit this girl that's, I think she's an orphan. And she comes in and she has an ability that's like fairly strong. So there, there's three of them and they come up against other like youngsters that are like, you know, bickering, like who's going to get the job. 
but they are always messing up on one case to the next they go from one craziness to the next but there's also a really nice arc that interweaves itself in between the cases that they find themselves having to to filter through so you, you have a sort of a an arc or storyline finished at the end of season one but there's so much coming which makes me worried <laughs> because it's netflix and it's very good and anytime i say it's very good and it's netflix they cancel it and i yeah. saw an article just this week when netflix ceo said no we've never canceled anything that's been popular that's not been that's not our i don't know, like that's that's, that's that, bullcrap because 1899 was on your top 10 like in your top five for weeks it yeah. was like had so many views you're telling me that's like the other things there's so many of those series that were doing well that had views i, I don't believe that for a second yeah uh, well and, and again to the the whole beauty of the streaming platform is that it sits there yeah you know and and continue generating yeah evergreen yeah exactly people discover it through word of mouth and then oh my gosh you have a new you know all of a sudden people more people are coming to it because they they've heard about it now you know it yeah makes no sense so this i mean this was thoroughly entertaining it, it, it's they're solid 45 minutes sometimes 50 minutes okay. an episode we watched all 10 episodes in two nights or eight episodes oh. or eight episodes in two nights so it's four nice. and four and we yeah. would just like put on the next one put on the Kirsten was ab absorbed it's the quirkiness of the sword fighting with the ghosts and the, mm. the the Britishness and set in London areas it it just I think it ticks all the right switches for us so if you enjoy that sort of sci-fi fantasy stuff with that sort of British humor I think this is definitely your cup of tea to be even more British yeah <laughs> well it sounds exactly like my cup of tea so yeah. I am excited <laughs> cool lastly i have one more i'll be quickly this is, this is a part one and two to my shame i've never owned these and i think i've never seen both films through it's one of those films that when it's on well i would say back in the day before streaming when you're flicking through channels and it's late mm -hmm. at night you can't sleep it's one of those films that come on and you're like oh, i'll watch a bit of that and it's one of jackie chan's films uh oh. have you ever watched armor of god no, I've never. Even okay, heard of that. cool. So there's Arm of God one and two. Let me show you the artwork. Here you go. Ooh. Okay. So what's really funny is each time there was an indie movie that came out, Arm of God would come out a couple of years later. Uh, it was like Temple Dew came out, Arm of God came out a couple of years later, and there's a lot of references or like set pieces that are very similar to that indie movie. So oh. if you take Jackie Chan, big set pieces lots of stunt work that it's all done by a very young jackie like super young jackie mm. whose name is actually jackie chan in the movie but he goes by he's a tomb raider and he goes by like a uh, hawk is another name and he, that's how it starts off with exactly like indy it starts off with he's raiding something it's definitely jackie's version of indy but then you get wow. jackie's martial arts in it and his stunt pieces each film finishes off during the credits with how all the stunts went wrong and you see how injured Jackie gets oh during gosh. the making. So that's the credit and you just see, like in, in both films, he almost died. Like you see how injured he, he gets because he puts his all into everyone and he does the stunts. And sometimes you're wondering how on earth did they get away with like, some of the platforms that Jackie's fighting on top of are super high and there were no nets. There was no like wires and you're like, oh, flipping egg. You see, see him shout cut and he's going like this because he knew he almost just felt his death it's, it, and it's brilliant so it, but the fun that the i would say this is a mixture of mm, a little bit of um the ark of the covenant one and the crusade oh okay okay uh, but so, so the the first one armor of god he's trying to find this pieces of armor that were from a war that were said to like hold like significance which is why uh, you know put on the whole armor of god from the bible sort of thing but uh someone someone kidnaps his friend's best he's someone, someone kidnaps his best friend's girlfriend and so they hold the ransom and he's got to go go and do that and the whole adventure ensues and it's a similar uh, sort of thing for number two crazy crazy fighting if you ever if you think like jackie chan early day films a drunken master that kind of i don't know how many of jackie's films you've seen 
But Not for me, before there was Jet Li, before there was Jean-Claude Van Damme, the guy that set the stage for it all was Jackie Chan. And then you take, which was obviously like, I mean, I know people are going to argue with it, but obviously kind of ripple from the, the indie films. Too similar sure. not to Dot to Be, but they did their own thing as well. Uh, very, very highly regarded as some of Jackie Chan's best work and stunt work. And I'm just, I'm so happy that they're out in Blu-ray with that kind of, the artwork alone. Oh, and yeah. you, in all the makings of and the special features, you just get to see how much he's willing to punish himself on the screen. And there's, you can't even describe how much, how intricate the fight scenes are, the environment that he uses, you know, the, the guy spinning ladders, uh, uh, rolling on barrels, you know, flipping people backwards. The stunt guys, that like his stunt team, the way they're able to land on their neck and not die, you know, you just like... I love it. Thank you guys, but I am worried for you. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. you're making it a little too real here. (laughs) Um, And as much as I love it, there are definitely things that have aged about it. Like if you watch the Mm. indie films, there's things about those films that have have aged. The score is hilarious. There's literally a bit where I was doing this in the air with the synth. And for those listening on the audio, it's it's my finger pushing down on uh, a keyboard with the one thing. Wow. Whoa, you know that, that that that's the score in some of it, and I'm just like, this is ridiculous. I could have done this in my sleep, uh, but when it comes to fighting, nothing has ever come close. You know, John Wick. Everybody kind of mimics Jackie Chan stuff, like mm. from from early in the days. And Jackie has his people they looked up at, but between him and Bruce Lee, they set the stage for martial arts in film, and those yeah. are two of the best that you're ever gonna get. So. Fun, 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 fun. That's cool. I'm gonna have to look for those. I've, You've I've never, never seen even them. heard of them. What? Never, I, I never even heard of it. Amazing. So that's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm always up for some ridiculous action, so that is. That's Jackie. That's I you love it. Well, I saw something on YouTube. I don't know a few weeks ago, and I don't remember what the context was, and I don't remember if it was Jackie Chan or if it was Michelle Yao or maybe both of them. Hmm. Um. But there was like like this train, like they were fighting on a train and one of them fell off. Like yeah. the train is. Yeah, police. Like I think move- it might be a police story. Michelle Yeoh and Jackie Chan are in that movie. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. No, they did that stunt. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly Whoa. the stunt you're talking about. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, even, yeah. even if the train isn't moving. Still. you're falling from like 12 feet up in the air, like, yeah. but not just falling off. I mean, you're moving as you. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, it, it's the stuff they've done is, is stupid, but amazing. Yeah, I was I mean, thinking, was just, I mean, who do we have that's like that now? The closest person is Tom Cruise. He doesn't do the martial arts, but he certainly does the stunts. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Who else the does the that? insanity of that. Yeah. Um, well, the the martial arts would be, what's his name? And I'm going to destroy it. Iko I- Uko Iwais from The oh, Raid. Oh, Iko Iwais from The Raid, yeah. I, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, he's great. Uh, it used to be Jet Li, but he's he doesn't do it so much anymore. Uh, Tony Jaa, he's old now too. Yeah, he's his old. Yeah, Tony Jaa. There are they've they've moved on. We we need newbies that are willing to kind of take and champion <laughs> on that. But, but like, so, unless they're sure. training like them, like I, I'm not sure though that we're gonna get a lot of that just because it, uh, at least from any studio movies. Yeah, not willing to license. Hey, yeah, because yeah. of the liability there. I mean, like you we need to have your own you know, production Tom company, Cruise. like Tom Cruise. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, gosh. So good. Yeah, which makes it what, so thrilling to watch. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, well, yeah I'm, I'm done cool. now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we th- we thank you so much for watching. Uh, please don't forget to share, like, subscribe. Ruben with the Ruby Tuesday. Me, Chris, with Movies and Munchies. Uh, we're going to put in the description below links to the audio portion of the podcast. So you mm-hmm. will get everything you just saw. Plus bonus stuff we're talking about. We're doing an exclusive movie review within there. Uh, Some entertainment news. Some of the things that we're looking forward to that's coming up. Um, Also, as Ruben had mentioned, uh, please, just for a few dollars a month, you can check out. Well, let me start over because that makes. That made no sense of what I was trying to say. <laughs> For a few dollars a month, you can help support this channel um, or more so the production of the show and the podcast um, on our Patreon. Uh, you can check it out at any time, patreon.com slash the bearded ones. It's also linked in the description below there. Uh, like Ruben said, we have over 40 videos 
in there. Some is ridiculousness. Some is movie reviews. Some is. That's good grammar. Some, some is are movie are. reviews. Some is are. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, yeah, we have movie reviews. We talk about entertainment. We dive into uh, some news topics. Then there's also just some ridiculousness. Also, um, there's a part where I give Ruben diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so... We invite, invite you we, to check that out there. Uh, you can always tweet at us at Best We Watched. And uh, with that, hey, we thank you. We will see you next week. All right. Take care. Take care.